so this is definitely going to be a controversial video. Before I get into the topic, I just want to give a response to the likely arguments people will make without understanding my opinion, because I know people are going to misinterpret my views. So number one, I'm not advocating drug use at all. This is just an educational video. Number two, if anti-doping worked 100% of the time, I would actually be all for it. I just don't think anti-doping should exist because of the problems it creates. Number three, if sport didn't have anti-doping, it would have its own problems for sure. Like this video isn't about why athletes should use PEDs. It's not giving a solution to the problem. It's just me talking about the problems with having anti-doping. I'm just criticizing it and explaining why I'm against it, not anymore. And number four, I'm not against anyone that is pro anti-doping. Like this is just my opinion and people are free to disagree with me. Before I get into anything else, I have to talk about something I hope a lot of people who watch my videos know. So pretty much all professional top level athletes use drugs and have been for decades. And I know that's extremely obvious to some of you, but it just blows my mind when I realize just how many people are completely unaware of this. And if you don't believe me, there's a lot of evidence for this. Like classified documents from the time East Germany was dominating in the Olympics has been released publicly, where you could even find a graph of how shot put performance increased when a woman took Trenable. And in that document, there's also an example of a doping protocol athletes followed pre-competition in order to pass drug tests. If you just look at how many athletes have got caught with retrospective drug testing, which means testing urine samples years after they were first collected, it's obvious that top level athletes use drugs. The craziest example of all this is that Thomas Zielinski originally came ninth place in the 2012 Olympics in the 94 kilo category. But after the retests, he actually got bumped up to third place, getting a bronze medal. Later on, uh, he tried to compete in the 2016 Olympics, but before he even lifted, him and his brother got caught with drugs. Like it kind of seems like a joke of a story, but there's many examples of this. And I'm sure a lot of you have watched the documentary Icarus, where he explains what Russia did for the 2014 Sochi Olympics, where they drilled a hole in a wall to pass urine samples through to evade doping tests. If you look at the fastest 100 meter times in history, you can see almost all of them have got caught taking drugs. And it's obvious, like some athletes are treated differently with doping tests. And of course, everyone's favorite weightlifter, Lasha, was banned in 2013 when he tested positive for Winstraw. A couple of years after his suspension ended, he added 80 kilos to his total, becoming the greatest super heavyweight of all time, while passing every single drug test for the past couple of years. I could spend all day giving examples and proof that top level athletes use drugs, but then this video would be just way too long. Again, I'm just amazed that a lot of people don't realize that professional athletes use drugs. And people that know also assume everyone knows. Um, but I'd say only a small percentage of the population knows what's going on. Even people in my comment section say they believe most top athletes are clean. So with that obvious fact that everyone should know, there's a lot of corruption in weightlifting and sports in general. And this really isn't talked about enough. But what is the source of this corruption? Like what allows this corruption to exist. Like I hear people always talk about the positives of anti-doping, but people don't realize that there's also a lot of negatives that come with anti-doping. Like you're probably wondering, like, how is this? Like, isn't drug testing supposed to protect people and create a fair sporting environment? Like, does it really create a level playing field? Does it prevent people from having an unfair advantage over other people? Like, just looking solely at that, it actually does the complete opposite. Like, that might sound kind of crazy to you, but just think about it for a minute. Do you really believe drug testing in every country in the world is equal? Well, if you're born in a westernized country where drug testing is generally stricter, you'll be a severe disadvantage compared to a weightlifter born in a country where drug testing is far less strict. For example, 
If you're born in America, where you get tested multiple times per year outside of competition, how can you hope to compete against a weightlifter from a country like North Korea, where out of competition drug testing is non-existent? And yes, North Korean weightlifters are winning Olympic medals. Like, do you really think WADA enters a country like North Korea to perform out of competition drug testing? There are multiple countries where drug testing is corrupt and non-existent. In order for WADA to enter some countries, they'd have to obtain visas. Those countries can get notified when they apply for visas, so the athletes in that country can simply go off their drugs, get tested, and be clean. Do you think the likes of Iran, China, Russia, and other countries have as robust drug testing as the United States? Like, even drug testing in Ireland is far less strict than that of America. So someone living here would have an advantage over an American lifter. Someone in Egypt, where anabolics are legal, can simply walk into a pharmacy and buy whatever they want and barely ever get drug tested. And in Denmark and Belgium, anabolics are so demonized that they drug test random people in commercial gyms. So every country around the world has different laws, different drug testing measures, and different amounts of funding for anti-doping. Also, since it's relevant now, are athletes getting tested during this pandemic? Like, how was this even possible during the hard lockdowns? Borders were closed, many countries were locked down, and loads are going to have to go into hard lockdowns again. Like, doping organizations around the world even stated they were prioritizing public health and safety uh, over anti-doping. So multiple countries actually suspended drug testing during the hard lockdowns. That allowed athletes from even countries with robust drug testing to be able to take PEDs without any consequence. There was even this laughable attempt to drug test athletes remotely. They'd have to show the doping control officer the bathroom they'd use, and then they'd time and measure the athlete's temperature to ensure the athletes were giving a sample. Like, obviously this can be easily cheated, and it was only voluntary. So let's say drug testing didn't exist at all, and PEDs as a result weren't so demonized by the public. With no drug testing, it would actually create a more level playing field. Now I know people are going to think this would cause a bunch of problems, but I'm not talking about that right now. It's a true fact on its own, if anti-doping didn't exist, sports would actually be fair. This goes against WADA's goal, where on their website they state, WADA works to ensure that athletes benefit from the same anti-doping protocols and protections, no matter the nationality, the sport, or the country we're tested. The ultimate goal is safe and fair competition worldwide. In practice, they're not achieving this at all. All they're doing is making it so that athletes with the most money, best access to drugs, the athletes that have access to labs that can check if they're clean, athletes from mess up countries where drug testing doesn't exist, they're going to be the ones that win. Not the weightlifter in America that gets drug tested multiple times a year, where PEDs are illegal. People would argue athletes just shouldn't use drugs if it's against the rules. But to me, this is ridiculous because sports is like war. Telling people to stop using drugs is like going into a war zone and telling both sides they can't use guns. Plus, there's a lot of money on the line. Winning an Olympic medal isn't just an achievement an athlete would be proud of. It ultimately makes them more money. Money that can be made by passing a drug test. Sports have been used as a political tool in many countries. Just see the lengths the East Germans went to to win medals. Why do you think the USSR wanted to win a bunch of Olympic medals? The whole reason drug testing is there is to create an illusion for kids to believe that sports are fair and they're a nice healthy activity to partake in. Like people shouldn't think of sports as something healthy. The majority of top level athletes aren't healthy and some shorten their lifespans by abusing drugs just to win. Trying to become a professional athlete shouldn't be looked at as a healthy endeavor or something that is positive for that person's life. And that's just the nature of sports whether you like it or not. And honestly, I don't even like it. It would be good if sports were clean. If drug testing worked 100% of the time and it caught everyone that used PEDs, I would definitely support it. But all it does now is create a lot of corruption and an unfair system. Also, the expense of anti-doping is ridiculous. Billions of dollars have been used just to catch a small percentage of athletes that use drugs. And believe me, that percentage is very small. Like throughout anti-doping's lifetime, I would bet it has caught less than 1% of athletes that have used PEDs. 
millions upon millions of dollars to achieve that. So if you're born in a westernized country with good drug testing, it's close to impossible to be competitive internationally. People say nonsense like talent and hard work can beat drug use, but the people who win Olympic medals are extremely talented and use drugs. So someone who's talented can't beat someone who's talented and uses drugs. So surely with millions of dollars of funding, anti-doping has come a long way in creating doping tests that can catch most athletes that use PEDs. Well, they haven't. Most people are clueless about how athletes pass drug tests and don't realize that certain drugs either have short detection times or the drug test itself is flawed. Probably the most widely used PED in sports is testosterone. Although it was synthesized in 1935, there still isn't a good anti-doping test for testosterone. The current test for testosterone is the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio test, or the TTE ratio test, and this is used alongside the carbon isotope ratio test. So to understand how the TT ratio test works, you first have to understand how testosterone is produced in the body. So epitestosterone is formed as a byproduct in the creation of testosterone. Now epitestosterone is similar in structure to testosterone. They're epimers, meaning they are mirror images of each other. So testosterone and epitestosterone cannot be excreted in urine because they're not soluble. But during metabolism, chemical groups are added to them, making them soluble in urine. So normally, testosterone and epitestosterone are excreted in a one-to-one -one ratio in the urine. So when someone goes on a steroid cycle and they take testosterone, that ratio will increase because the amount of epitestosterone excreted will not change because they're only taking testosterone and they're not taking epitestosterone. So the normal ratio will change. So if the ratio exceeds four to one, then the athlete is taught to be doping. However, there are many flaws to this test. For one, the natural ratio of testosterone to epitestosterone can vary because of genetics. Some people can have a ratio that is far lower. This is because they lack an enzyme which excretes testosterone in the urine. If a person lacks two copies of the gene that codes for that enzyme, they will excrete less testosterone than a person that has two copies of the gene. Also, the presence or absence of the gene depends on race. African populations have a high frequency of the gene, and East Asians have a low frequency of the gene. What this means is that a person with a naturally low ratio of testosterone to epitestosterone in their urine can inject testosterone and not exceed the 4 to 1 ratio and their urine will not be tested as a result using the carbon isotope ratio test. This means they can inject testosterone right before a competition and get away with it. The carbon isotope test is certainly a better test for testosterone, but since it's so expensive, it's not used unless someone fails the TT ratio test. Another problem is that athletes can microdose testosterone. In one study, nine people took 3.5 milligrams of testosterone in Nante per kg of body weight once per week for six weeks. So for someone weighing 100 kilos, that's 350 milligrams of testosterone per week. That's certainly a performance enhancing dose. The results showed that four out of nine of those people did not exceed the four to one ratio of testosterone to epitestosterone. So if these people were tested under WADA's test for testosterone, they would pass the test. This also isn't taking into account the different esters available for testosterone. The testosterone used in the study was testosterone enantate, which is testosterone with a seven carbon ester chain. The addition of an ester chain increases the half-life, so it lasts longer in the body. Athletes can use shorter acting versions of testosterone, such as testosterone propanate, which has a three carbon ester chain. A popular PED athletes use is TNE, which is testosterone with no ester attached. So this is extremely short acting. And with careful dosing, athletes can use testosterone right up to the competition. And there's also testosterone gels and patches, which are extremely short acting. Another method used by athletes to beat doping tests is by injecting epitestosterone alongside testosterone. A pharmaceutical company founded in East Germany actually produced epitestosterone propanate, 
which was used exclusively um, by the doping system since it had no commercial value. And injections of epitestosterone propanate and testosterone propanate were given to top level athletes to bring the TT ratio back into the normal range. So to tackle the problems with the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio test, WADA came out with the biological passport. The way athletes get around this test is by microdosing or carefully dosing the testosterone around doping tests. By microdosing, the TT ratio will not change significantly and it will only rise for a short period. So if an athlete carefully doses T and E, their TT ratio can return to normal within a few hours. Also, the biological passport only becomes effective when multiple data points are made, which is obviously a problem for athletes who have never been tested. So despite WADA's best efforts and over a billion dollars put into anti-doping, they still cannot catch every athlete who decides to take testosterone, which keep in mind was a PED created almost a century ago. So probably the most advanced way athletes pass drug tests is by taking designer compounds. A lot of you probably heard of the Balco scandal where designer steroids were given to athletes. These are steroids that are completely undetectable because they are unknown by WADA. During the synthesis of new drugs, typically thousands of analogs are synthesized. Then a number of trials take place in order to find the most suitable compound. Of course, this happened in the 1950s and 60s, when a lot of research was performed on steroids for clinical use. A lot of that research was published, and a lot of these steroids were tested for anabolic activity. A reason many of them aren't on the market is most likely because they failed to treat a certain medical condition, or they had too many side effects. So what Balco did was they synthesized norbolatone, THG, and DMT. Norbolatone was a steroid that was actually synthesized by a pharmaceutical company called Wyatt, but they did not release it to the market, so this steroid was not on WADA's banned list. Patrick Arnold, an organic chemist, found a way to synthesize Norbolatone in just a one-step reaction with a steroid that was in contraception pills. This was completely undetectable at the time, and many people got away with using it. He also synthesized THG, which resembles a patient from 1969, from a French pharmaceutical company. And during police investigations of Balco, they found the other designer steroid, DMT. There's even more examples of designer steroids that supplement companies have created, the most famous being Superdrol. Others made by supplement companies are M1T and Epistane. So you can imagine that somewhere in the world there's probably chemists synthesizing designer steroids unknown to WADA. Of course, these are completely undetectable and they're probably more dangerous since they have no clinical research done on them. Of course, there are many other ways of passing doping tests. A cocktail of drugs named the Duchess Cocktail was used by Russians in the 2012 Olympics. This mixed Anavar, Primobolin, and Oral Trembolone in alcohol. So the idea was to absorb the drugs through the cheek lining instead of swallowing it. So using this method, it actually shortened the detection window of the compounds. Also, oral trembolone is one of the most dangerous steroids ever created. The only reason athletes used it was because of anti-doping. They probably wouldn't use it otherwise. So with all these flaws, isn't the solution to create a more level playing field by advancing anti-doping science? No, when you think about it, the advancement of anti-doping achieves the complete opposite. If anti-doping tests are improved, this just creates a more unlevel playing field because then it comes down to who has the best connections, who has the most money, who has the best help for them to evade a drug test. Those are the people that are going to win, not the athletes that have stayed clean for their entire career. And well, that's happening right now. Like right now, athletes are still competing while doping because they have the resources in order to do so. For athletes aiming to win, the option isn't what is the safest compound to use, it's what compounds have the shortest detection times and what they can get away with. So if you're an athlete that wants to be competitive internationally, you're going to have to use dangerous PEDs with shorter detection times, some of which there's barely any research put into them and certainly not clinical trials. 
Of course, there's the option to use nothing, but then it's impossible to win against people who are willing to take a compound that has never been tested. If anti-doping didn't exist, at least athletes would have the option to use PEDs, with decades of research performed on them. During the 1970s, female East German athletes were given Terenobol because of its short detection time. This had many bad side effects for women. Oral steroids are generally more liver toxic and have a more negative effect on lipids, but typically have shorter detection times. If there wasn't such a negative stigma about drug use and anti-doping just didn't exist in sports, the laws would actually be different around the world. This would mean certain PEDs would be legal like they were in the past. This would at least give athletes the option to use safer pharmaceutical grade drugs instead of possibly contaminated underground gear made in someone's microwave. Also, if they were legal, it would be easier to perform more research on them for safe usage. The majority of research into anabolics was conducted in the 1960s. Most anabolics were created back then. Right now, it's harder to conduct research into PEDs, especially for performance, because of the legality. And it's not just for sports. For example, peptides can have a large range of uses, like anti-aging, recovering connected tissue, improving appetite, and many other clinical uses. But when a compound gets added to the band list, it becomes harder to conduct research on it. Most athletes are using compounds that are 60 years old. What if anti-doping didn't exist? There would certainly be a lot more research put into them. There certainly wouldn't be a lack of funding given the popularity. Look at the amount of money put into supplements, some of which are more dangerous than actual anabolics by the way. What if millions of dollars put into anti-doping was instead put into research for doping? Now don't get me wrong, I'm not pro use of PEDs. There are certainly loads of problems with it, especially when children are involved. But the thing is, this is already happening. Teens are using PEDs and anti-doping isn't stopping bad things like this happening. I actually think it would be best if no athletes use PEDs and the sport was clean, as I think it would be best for everyone's health if they didn't use street drugs. However, putting a ban on these drugs only worsens the problem. If anti-doping caught 100% of the people that use drugs, I would certainly be pro-anti-doping, as it's a better outcome for everyone's health. However, it clearly isn't close to that effective, and it's impossible to achieve that. So let's say, hypothetically, that anti-doping science advanced so much that it was able to catch 100% of people that use PEDs. Would that create a level playing field? Would that stop people from using PEDs in sport? Like, it seems reasonable to say yes to that question. But believe it or not, some athletes would still get away with taking drugs, even if anti-doping was 100% foolproof. So, how would all that be possible? Well, the idea is to avoid getting your urine sample tested altogether. So an example of this is the 2014 Sochi Olympics, where Russian athletes use PEDs all the way up to competition. And the way they got away with this is they just got their urine samples swapped with untainted urine in this crazy operation. You can learn about that if you watch Icarus. So urine substitution is a common method that has been used to pass anti-doping tests. And believe it or not, doppelgangers have even been used to take tests for doping athletes. So basically with money, with bribes, anything is possible. Between 2012 and 2016, 5 million US dollars was given to a member of the International Weight Federation, the IWF, to cover up uh, Russian weightlifters that were doping. And a German documentary released last year highlighted the corruption in weightlifting, and they uncovered between 2008 and 2017, almost 50% of medalists weren't even tested in the World Championships and Olympic Games. So that's pretty crazy. And last year, the McLaren report discovered that at least 10.4 million US dollars was unaccounted for by the IWF multiple doping positives were covered up, and vote buying was present in the Federation. The president of the IWF at the time was forced to resign because of the scandal. 
After all this, Ursula Pamandrea, the acting president of the IWF, was trying to reform the Federation, but she was removed from that position in an emergency meeting and replaced by a man who was suspected of giving cash bribes in the past. After this, national federations called for the board to resign and start new elections, given the amount of corruption. The IOC, of course, is not happy with the failings of the IWF, and they warned that unless the IWF fixes the current problems in a very timely manner, it will be removed from the 2024 Olympics. So, given this warning, the IWF opted for the new elections to take place after the Olympic Games in October, which was a very bold move by the IWF. So with all that, weightlifting is really risking getting removed from the Olympic Games. Of course, everyone isn't happy with this. But the thing is, the Olympics itself is an unfair competition because of anti-doping. Most, if not all these scandals by the IWF wouldn't be possible if anti-doping didn't exist. Anti-doping is present in sports as a means to control who wins and who loses. It facilitates corruption. Without it, there would be no way for countries to bribe their way to victory. The Olympics really shouldn't be respected as much as it is. It's corrupt itself. The only way to be competitive is by breaking the rules. Almost no Olympic medal won in track and field, weightlifting, and other sports was done without breaking the rules. People are brainwashed when they're growing up to believe top-level athletes are clean. People are taught that doping is bad, unethical, and dangerous. Athletes that are caught are labeled as evil, and they lose sponsors and money. They're essentially cancelled. People are afraid to talk about their drug use, as doing so would risk their livelihood. Doping is seen as a great evil, but why is this? Were you just taught to hate people that dope without even questioning why, or asking yourself why anti-doping even exists? Why is there a war against doping in sport? Why is PED use considered unethical? Why is it a good outcome to prevent people from using PEDs? And why is anti-doping seen as something that's ethical and necessary? Anti-doping programs claim that doping goes against the spirit of sport. The question is, if anti-doping wasn't a thing, and PEDs weren't so demonized, how would doping be against the spirit of sport? Strongman is a very competitive sport, and if you dope, even when there's no drug testing in the sport, are you going against the spirit of sport? No, because you're trying to be competitive, you're trying to win. Like, would someone really say Eddie Hall and Haftor are going against the spirit of sport? No one says that. In drug-tested sport, you're only going against the spirit of sport by breaking rules created by anti-doping programs because they claim drug use goes against human values and fair play. When it only does because they claim it does. But why is what they say accepted by everyone? Everyone should be aware of the dangers of PED use. If someone isn't willing to sacrifice their health, they simply shouldn't participate in professional sport. And that is the case right now. Recreational bodybuilding isn't drug tested, yet there are many that decide not to take drugs because they don't want to suffer side effects or for other reasons. Also, the negative health effects of PEDs are highly exaggerated. Sure, the ridiculous doses that bodybuilders and strongmen are taking is quite alarming, but those athletes are aware of the risks they're taking and they have chosen to take gear. A 100 meter runner, weightlifter, swimmer, and most Olympic athletes would experience diminishing returns from doses super high. The doses used by most Olympic athletes is far smaller than that used in strongman and bodybuilding. And that isn't because they are trying to evade tests. It's because a gain in muscle mass and a huge gain in water retention usually isn't optimal for most athletes. Of course, there are athletes that would use a lot more, but there is a point of diminishing returns which is far lower than the doses seen in bodybuilding and strongman. Some top level athletes use lower doses than what a beginner bodybuilder would use. So is PED use really as dangerous as anti-doping would like you to believe it is? It's not a simple yes or no answer. It depends on a lot of things. 
there are hundreds of PEDs a person can use. Would it be rational to say that they're all equally dangerous? Is a 300 mg per week cycle of testosterone as dangerous as DMP and oral trembolone? Of course it isn't. In my opinion, anti-doping is unethical because in practice, it creates an unlevel playing field, it facilitates corruption, it demonizes PEDs, some of which have clinical uses, it forces people to use dangerous compounds, and it brainwashes the public to believe sport is fair and no top athlete uses drugs. When I was younger, I wish I was told the truth about sports and how corrupt it is. Instead, I was fed this false reality that anti-doping is effective and sports are fair. Slowly, I realized how corrupt it was, and I found myself questioning what I was doing. If I knew how corrupt it was when I was younger, I would have never decided to participate in competition. And this is what children should be taught growing up. They should be told that all top-level athletes use drugs. Told how corrupt it is at the top level, and the goal of becoming a professional athlete shouldn't be encouraged. A young whale up there should be told they're at a severe disadvantage if they want to compete internationally. They should be told if they want to become an Olympic champion, they'll have to take drugs and live in fear for many years of their life, hoping that they don't get caught. This isn't what anti-doping wants to tell you. They want to make you believe sport is fair, to romanticize the idea of a drug-free athlete winning an Olympic medal. I cringe when people ask me why I don't compete in the Olympics. Like, why would I even be interested in competing in the most corrupt competition in the world? A competition that is completely unfair. It's sad the way people respect it so much, given how corrupt it is. It's really demotivating to compete at a high level, because it comes down to what country you're born in, how much money you have, and what connections you have. It's not just about talent or hard work. It's about being lucky and taking chances in this corrupt system that anti-doping has created.